Revelation Part 2. We're going to continue in this Part 2 with Revelation Chapter 6. This Revelation Chapter 6 is one of the most important books, or one of the most important chapters of this book of Revelation, because it gives the seven seals, which are the seven events and or the seven truths as given by Christ which bring about the end of this earth age. You will find that these seals are not necessarily in chronological order but they are as they were taught by Christ as to their importance. So without further ado Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1 and before we begin let us, as always, as you should always do when you study the word of our Father, go to his throne and ask for guidance and wisdom. Heavenly Father, our sovereign King of the universe, a God in which there is no iniquity, we come before you this day, Father, and we ask that you give us the truth. We ask that you give us to drink of the water of life and to eat of the bread of life. We ask you to reveal to us the hidden truth from your word, Father, as we seek your word and seek your counsel from your word. We know that you are the giver of all wisdom, Father, and that you make known secrets which have been hidden since the foundations of the world. And we ask these things knowing that you will give them, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahshua, the true Messiah. Amen. So Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. And this will be continuing with John's vision. And I saw when a lamb opened one of the seals. In other words, we had learned in the last lecture that only the lamb was found worthy to open the book which had seven seals. And this lamb is, of course, Jesus Christ. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. In other words, this is action, authority. And one of the four beasts, which is actually the four angels, saying, Come and see. Verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown. The crown, of course, symbolic of a kingdom. A crown was given unto him. A kingdom was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, this was seal number one that Christ gave us. The first and most important seal that there is a rider coming on a white horse who is, of course, the false Messiah, the false Christ. And he will ride the white horse. But this is not the white horse of Revelation chapter 19, which carries the true Christ. And he carries a bow, mimicking the bow, or the glorious rainbow that surrounds the throne of God. And this word bow, in other words, the bow that this one riding on this white horse carries, is the Greek word G5115, which means a bow, apparently of the simplest fabric. In other words, a cheap fabrication. In other words, it's not the real bow of God. It's not the real bow of Christ. What this means in more simplistic terms is he appears to be Christ. But he is not Christ. As Jesus himself warned us in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21, you've got three witnesses, 
And as Paul warned us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the entire chapter, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. Verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now, a red horse is, of course, symbolic of war. But what else is it symbolic of? Well, what is red symbolic of? Red is symbolic of Esau, of Edom, of the people that became the Rus, and the nation that brought forth socialism and communism. If we go to Genesis chapter 27 and read verse 40, we find that Esau was bitterly weeping because Jacob had taken his birthright because Esau had sold it to him for a uh, bowl of red soup, red pottage. And Genesis 27:40 says, "And by the sword shalt thou live, and shall serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke off of thy neck." And this rider of the red horse takes peace from the earth. We know that it is written that Edom, or Esau, in the end times, shall come against his brother in war, as written in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But also this rider takes peace because he is with the rider of the white horse, which is to say, the false Christ, and only the true Christ brings true peace. So then this red horse, this red rider, is part of the deception. And quite frankly, part of that that builds the world, uh, one world system of global government. In other words, through socialism and finally communism, which prepares the way for this false Christ by removing the truth from the hearing of men so that this antichrist, false Christ, can waltz in and make everything okay and everyone will get real religious all of a sudden and they will all fall and be worshipping the wrong Christ, the antichrist, unbeknownst to them because they are biblically illiterate. Verse 5. Excuse me. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Now the black horse is of course symbolic of famine. But what is the famine for the end times? If you read the entire chapter of Amos chapter chapter 8, you will gain a much deeper understanding of this. Because the famine, as written in 11, verse 11 of Amos 8, is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God. And since this black horse is with the red horse, and with the white horse, that means it, it, this famine comes with the red, the war, and the, the communism, socialism, and with the white horse that carries the Antichrist, then they all work together for the same goal, which is deception. But again, if you read the entire chapter of Amos 8, you will gain a much greater understanding because God has put this together like a great puzzle to reveal the truth. And actually, that is the key of David. In other words, the entire Bible... You don't just base what you believe on a, a verse here or a verse there or a, a verse at this place or a verse at that place or what your good pastor says or what your church letter says or what your doctrine is. Independent study of the word, study to show thyself approved, is what keeps you from deception.
that and much prayer to our Father and asking for wisdom and understanding. Verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, this, the, this rider of the black horse has a set of balances in his hands. And again, if you read Amos chapter 8, you will see false weights and balances spoken of. In other words, this concerns usury. And it is designed to where the people can be bought with usury or even bribes or with government entitlements or through overtaxation. A penny at the time of this writing was a day's wage. So in other words, what this is saying is you will work all day for a measure of wheat, enough to make a loaf of bread, or a measure of barley, enough to make some soup. Think about the taxation going on today in the world. How you doing, friend? Is it a little harder to get by these days than it was before? And prices shooting up all the time? And as prices shoot up, packages get smaller for a higher amount of money? Verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the fourth beast say, Come and see. Verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Now, who is this writer? Well, who is death? And who has the power of death? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. And they have the power over the fourth part of the earth. Well, what is the number of earth in biblical numerics? Four. So, in other words, what this is saying is over the whole earth. In other words, a one world government. And they kill with the aforementioned instruments of the horses, the sword, with hunger and with death. But what is the sword symbolic of? Revelation 1.16. The two-edged sword of Christ. Well... If you drop the S off of the word sword, what do you get? The word. They kill with the word. They use the word to deceive. And with it, they cause hunger, which will cause death spiritually, or can cause death spiritually. And you might as well say that these four together these four horses together and these four powers are the four hidden dynasties of the end times. Because they represent religion, in other words, the false Christ. They represent the economy through famine. They represent politics through policy. And they represent education to lies. And what is with these beasts of the earth that are with them? Well, in the book of Daniel, how about all the beasts that were covered? The beast systems. Not only the beasts of the book of Daniel, but the beasts that shall be spoken later on in this book of Revelation. There are political systems or kingdoms. Same difference. They're not actual beasts. They are systems. 
And in the book of Daniel, one was likened to a leopard and one was likened to a bear. And the bear, of course, symbolic of that red nation. And the spotted animal, the leopard, symbolic of the Kenites, the sons of Cain, who bring about and envision this one world government. Call them what you will. The Illuminati, the Bilderbergers. They've got many names. However, they are the self-same synagogue of Satan, which we covered in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. In other words, the testimony of the truth. They were slain for it. Anytime you teach the truth, you're going to be ridiculed, you're going to be persecuted, and in some cases you're going to be slain, as were many of the prophets, many of the apostles, and of course our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. Verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, Lord, O Lord, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood from them that dwell upon the earth, or are on the earth? Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. The white robes, of course, the raiment you earn for righteous acts. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were shall be fulfilled, should be fulfilled. Verse 12. And I beheld, and he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. Verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now this reeks of the book of Daniel, in case you... We just covered the book of Daniel. You should remember some of this. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. What did Christ warn us not to be harvested as? Untimely figs. That our flight be not in the winter. In other words, harvested out of season. By those who teach false doctrines such as the rapture of the church. Verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. In other words, we're talking about the day of wrath here, the day of the Lord. They're terrified because it has been discovered by them now that they have committed apostasy. In other words, they've been deceived and have been worshipping the wrong Christ. And they are so embarrassed till they pray for the mountains to fall on them. As it's written, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. A lot of people take this to mean pain as in agony. What it really means is embarrassment like you can't believe. Verse 17. For the great day of wrath, or of his wrath, is come, and who shall be able to stand? Well, those that have the truth will. Those who don't have the truth, not so much. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree, 
Now, the four winds are mentioned in the book of Daniel, and they always concern the time of the end. In other words, the four winds coming together upon one location. But right now they're held. Verse 17. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. In other words, in their minds. The seal of God is the opposite of the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is the deception of the mind. In other words, the mark of the beast means you would believe that the Antichrist is Christ and fall and worship him. Whereas the seal of God protects you from that. That is how we escape the hour of temptation. Not by flying away, but because we know the truth. Jesus said, Lo, I have foretold you all things. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. Israel, of course, meaning the prince that prevails with God or prevailed with God. And without God, he doesn't prevail. Verse 5. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Verse 8. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Now, you see it mentioned here Joseph. There is no tribe of Joseph. This would be better translated Ephraim. Because Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Manasseh has already been mentioned, however, Ephraim has not. Joseph had no tribe named after him to himself. And of course, I think I already mentioned Benjamin, but the 12 tribes were sealed. That's 12,000 per tribe. And it's not a literal number. It simply means... the election of the tribes of Israel were sealed. And some of these, of this 144,000, will fall for a time. That's why it was spoken earlier, wait until we have sealed the uh, our brethren with the seal of God in their forehead. In other words, some of them will, will fall for a time until the very elect, the 7,000 are delivered up and when the 7,000 began to speak with the tongue of Pentecost in other words when they began to utter with the voice of God then many of these are going to wake up instantly and realize what is going on and join with their brethren verse 9 after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palms in their hands. Now, do you get the deeper message of that? It says, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations. Did it say Israel? And all kindreds and people and tongues. That means of all people of the world, and they are arrayed in white robes. There are elect amongst every people on this planet. The elect are not consigned strictly to the tribes of Israel. Verse 10. 
And I cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which setteth upon the throne, and to the uh, Lamb. Verse 13, and the Lamb, of course, Jesus. Verse 13. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God. Verse 12. Saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. You know, there is a, uh, <laughs> a newly sprung up belief here that has begun teaching that when they say amen, they're actually saying Amun, as in Amun Ra, the God of Egypt. That is a falsehood. The word Amen simply means that's the way it is. That's the way it be. It is so. Verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in, arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How do you wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb? Well, for one thing, you repent. For another, you come to the faith. And for another, you do the will of God. Verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. At the end of this book you're going to see that God's dwelling place shall be with man. In other words, upon the earth. The earth shall become part of the new heaven. Verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Why? Because you won't need the sun. God will be their light. And they shall hunger no more, or thirst no more. What did Christ tell the woman at the well? If you drink of this water, you shall not thirst any more. Verse 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. What is the living fountain of water? It's Christ, the living water. And he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. In other words, there shall never again be sorrow. There shall never be pain. We won't age. We won't get sick. And we'll all be together as God's family. And we shall be in paradise. And we'll never be bored again. We won't need these little electronic gadgets and these games and televisions and all the little things we use to distract ourselves from life. And quite frankly, the tools which Satan and the Kenites use to distract us from the Word of God. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in the space in heaven about the space of half an hour. Remember the book of Daniel? Verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now these trumpets, or trumps, are in chronological order. Verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne verse 4 and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand Verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, 
God's altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Verse 7. And the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Verse 8. And the second angel sounded, as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Now there's deeper symbology in this. You might, um, well, we won't go into that right now. We'll cover it later. Verse 9. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships that were destroyed. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Verse 10. And the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Verse 11. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. You know, Years ago, there was an accident in Russia with a nuclear plant called Chernobyl, which poisoned people and caused birth defects and all kinds of things, and still is to this day. Chernobyl means wormwood. However, this is referring to the lies of Satan, which shall poison the waters, And the third part of waters became wormwood. And many men died of the waters because the waters were made bitter. In other words, what is the water we are supposed to drink? That, that we don't die? That we never thirst again? The living water. Christ. This is the opposite of that. This is the water of wormwood. The bitter water. That which causes men's souls to die. That is to say, if they don't find repentance or come to repentance and come to the truth in the millennium. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded. And the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, and the third part of them was darkened, and at day shone not for the third part of it, and at night likewise. How many of the stars of heaven did the tail of the serpent draw? One third. And if you smite a third of the sun or the moon so that they are darkened, what is darkness always symbolic of? Deception. And even in the night, if the moon is partially darkened, then you can't see as well. We're speaking of deception here. Verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of the earth, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And of course the word woe means warning. It's kind of like the robot from Lost in Space. Warning, warning, warning. Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. This smoke, which darkens, is deception. 
Verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, the locust army. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. In other words, this is referring to the time when the Kenites come to their full power. They have been in the stage of the canker worm and the palmer worm and the caterpillar, but now they are the locusts. In other words, they have hatched. They are released upon the earth. And they're given power as the scorpions have power. Verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men which have not, which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. In other words, those who are not sealed with the truth are the only ones that can be hurt. Verse 5. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion as he, when he striketh a man. Now most people imagine this as, oh, a scorpion when it strikes a man, it stings so bad and it hurts so bad. That's not what this is referring to. This is referring to how a scorpion takes its prey. A scorpion will latch on to its prey and then sting them with its tail. And then the body of its prey becomes a shell and all the insides become mush. Then the scorpions can consume them. In other words, the prey becomes the stomach of the scorpion and he drains it dry. This is symbolic of what false religion does to mankind. And their power is five months. And they come to power with the Antichrist. This tells you how long his reign shall actually be. It was originally to be a three and a half year period. Which I still think may play into this. Into the building up of one world order. And certain other events. But the power that Antichrist himself and his locust army has will be for five months. In other words, he will be here claiming to be Christ five months. Because God has shortened the days for his elect's sake. Verse 6. And in those days men shall seek death, and shall not find it, and desire to die. But death shall flee from them. And this is for the same reason that they pray for the mountains to fall upon them. Because they're deceived. Verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared to battle. And their, uh, on their heads were crowns like gold. And their faces were the faces of men. Does this give you a clue to uh, their crowns? They've got kingdoms. Do you remember the beast that's going to rise up out of the sea later in this book? Having seven heads and ten crowns? And why do they have the faces of men? Because they are men. The locust army are Kenites. They may also be made up of fallen angels, Nephilim, Nephilim. But Nephilim are also men, even though they are angelic. Gabriel, his very name means man of God. And Satan is also told that he shall be a man and no God in the hands of them that slay him. Verse 8. And they had hair as the hair of women. In other words, they're seductive. Long, flowing, beautiful hair. This is an analogy. It doesn't actually mean that they're going to have the hair of women. It just means they will have the seductive capability. When a man looks at a woman and sees a beautiful head of hair, he, he, he automatically... You know, I've seen women that from behind had such a lovely set of hair and I thought, wow, and they turned around and you know, it was kind of like, yee! <laughs> yeah, I jest. But they had hair as the hair of women. But their teeth were as the teeth of lions. In other words, they will eat you alive. A lion 
does not grab onto you like a dog does. He, a lion will tear you to shreds. He will shake you to pieces. You can even watch one of your domestic cats sometimes eating cat food. And they will grab onto it and just shake and shake and shake. Verse 9. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. In other words, a, an overwhelming, encompassing force. Verse 10. And they had tails un like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. Again, we've already covered that moments ago. Verse 11. And they had a king. Notice the lowercase k in king over them. Which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Whose name in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. And the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Both of those words, Apollyon and Apollyon and Abaddon mean the destroyer. It can also mean the desolator. Do you remember who the desolator is from Daniel 8 and 9? This is referring to none other than Satan. He is the king of the locust army and the king of the bottomless pit. Verse 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come uh, two woes more hereafter. Verse 13, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Verse 17, Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. In other words, this breaches the border between Babylon and between the land of Canaan. In other words, between Babylon, the king of Babylon, and Israel. In other words, this is when the deception comes to pass at the sixth trumpet. Verse 15. And the four angels were loose and prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Again, how many were drawn by the tail of the dragon? That's the whole reason that we're in this flesh age is because a third of God's children were deceived by Satan. And rather than destroying them then, God gave them a choice, a chance to come through this flesh age that they might achieve what they had not achieved before. To come to him. Verse 16. And not to follow Satan. Verse 16. And the number of the army of horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. Verse 17. And thus I saw the horses in a vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. But out of their tails issued fire and smoke and brimstone. In other words, We've already covered what a lion can do to you. But, what are lions also symbolic of? Lions are also symbolic of the tribe of Judah. In other words, these may look like lions. They may look like Jews. Or those who call themselves Jews. Remember what's written in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Those who call themselves Jews but are not but are the synagogue of Satan. Verse 18. By these three was the third part of men killed. By fire, by smoke, and by brimstone which issued out of their mouths. In other words, killed spiritually by deception. By the smoke of darkness, by brimstone, and by fire. Not the holy fire. Not God the consuming fire. Verse 19. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them they do hurt. Anything connected with the serpent. 
and their power and that what, what is the power of the mouth to speak to communicate so what if they speak and communicate lies? What if they teach falsehoods? That is where their power lies, in deception. Verse 20. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works, of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. In other words, talking about the idols. They're not alive, in other words. They're not gods. Verse 21. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their fornications, nor their thefts. In other words, these are not in good standing. Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a white cloud and a rainbow upon his head, and his face was it were as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Got any idea who this might be? Verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Verse 3, And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. There's yet another clue as to who this is. And when he had cried, seven thundered, uh, thunders uttered their voices. Seven thunders. Verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And again, a lot of people will say, Don't read the book of Revelation. It's a sealed book. And they do err. Verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Verse 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven... And the things that were therein are, and in the earth, and the things that there that therein are, and in the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. In other words, this is the end of days of the flesh. Verse seven. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared unto his servants the prophets. In other words, Jesus is the one that appears at the seventh trump. The one that appeared at the fifth trump and took power at the sixth is Satan. And you will see that he appears at the sixth trump, sixth seal, and sixth plague when you have read this entire book. In other words, he takes power at the sixth trump, sixth seal, and sixth plague. And that is why his number is 600, three score, and six. The number of a man. What man? The man of sin. The son of perdition, as written in the Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, saying, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Verse 9. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. This book is the Word of God, and it was handed to him by the Word of God, by Jesus himself. That's who this angel is. And the Word of God is sweet on your tongue as honey. And it's not bitter on your belly as to make you sick. That's not what this means. It means the things written therein, you're going to be persecuted for, and when you try to tell people about it, they're going to be bitter towards you, and it's going to make your belly bitter. 
This is not a literal sick stomach. This is a Greek analogy. A Greek manner of speech. Verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up. And it was sweet as my it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Now this thing was done to show you the truth. Okay? So what I just said a minute ago is true. This is a Greek analogy, but this was an example done for you so that you would understand the message. Verse eleven. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And every time this book of Revelation is read, John is prophesying to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. As it is written, the Gospels must be published amongst all nations. The truth must be published amongst all nations. Now, I think we're going to stop there for today. But always, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my prayer for you that you will take these matters to heart. That you will dig into these words, this book. Not only the book of Revelation, but the entire book. Jesus said, Lord, I come in the volume of the book. And he is the word. I hope you will take time to read the word and not let your Bible sit on a shelf and get dusty and be inactive and be of no effect in your life. Because your father loves you and his truth is in his word. And he even came here in the personage of Jesus Christ and gave up his life that we may have repentance and that we may gain salvation. See to it that you're not deceived. Study his word in depth. Go into the languages. And above all, pray for guidance and wisdom. And ask him for it. Because he will freely give it unto you. God bless you. And thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.